Grace to you, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From our text, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So far, God's word. Jesus <clears throat> did nothing in a vacuum, whether he was speaking or teaching or miracle working. Jesus acted in the context of his day and with an awareness of his surroundings and his audience, especially when he talked about the kingdom of God. Now, the setting for today's parable is the city of Jericho, just northeast of Jerusalem. If you may recall, it was at Jericho where God showed his power to his people as they began to settle into the promised land that he had originally given to Abraham. From the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter 6, the city of Jericho was the first and most major obstacle of to the children of Israel as they began their conquest. The city walls were so thick as to be considered impenetrable, but the Lord delivered the city to the Israelites. God's people were told to march around the city every day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. Then as the trumpets blew and the people shouted at the top of their lungs, the walls of Jericho fell flat. They were handed a victory over a great enemy. We know that story, perhaps. But what comes next? Not so much. When God had instructed Israel on how to conduct operations against Jericho, they were ordered to obey God's very specific orders down to the slightest detail. And while most did, a fellow by the name of Achan did not. God had ordered the destruction of everything in Jericho, even the riches of the city. Achan instead took some of the devoted things from the pagan temples, including silver and gold. Because he had hidden his ill-gotten booty in his tent, when they faced their next opponents, Israel was defeated. God explained to Joshua why he had not given them the victory. Because of the presence of Jericho's devoted things in the encampment. Achan's treachery was discovered. He, his family, and everything that he owned was slaughtered, burned, and then buried in order to set things right with God. And when they faced that same opponent a second time, they were victorious, unlike my beloved Houston Astros. Now, you may all wonder why this is noteworthy. Well, the sin of Achan had cost Israel a victory in the field and the death of many of its people. Achan was held accountable for refusing to obey God's commands. Things had to be set right. And this history were, was on the people's minds as Jesus is standing there in Jericho beginning to share his parable. And also, prior to our text, is the story of Jesus and a tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. It's a story of making things right. As a tax collector, Zacchaeus made his profit based on demanding payment of taxes to Rome from his own people. His profit came from the amount that he could raise over and above the Roman requirements. So if Rome looked for, let's say, $100 per household, a tax collector might charge an amount of $125 instead. $100 went to Rome, $25 went into their pocket. Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. He decides to show mercy and kindness to a reject of the Jews. And his mercy is met with an immediate response. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. From the Lord's kindness and display of mercy, a disavowed Jew is now restored to his people 
and he takes responsibility for his actions. This context speaks volumes about accountability. The first part of the chapter about a sinner's willingness to be held accountable, to make amends for his wrongdoing. So why not then a parable about accountability? We turn back to Luke 19. Jesus said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Now I'm going to stop there for just a second. You see, unlike many of Jesus' parables, this story has a historical setting. If it were a movie, it would have the tagline, based on real events. Archelaus was one of Herod the Great's sons. Somewhere around 4 to 5 B.C., he traveled to Rome in order to be confirmed as king. A Jewish delegation also went to Rome, opposing his appointment. Julius Caesar appointed Archelaus as a governor, not as a king, and to a smaller portion of land than what he had hoped for. Archelaus, upon his return, reaped revenge upon all who had opposed him. He was such a cruel leader that Caesar Augustus, I mean, Caesar Augustus years later, actually removed him from his post. Archelaus had so infuriated the Jews, they were beginning to stir up trouble, and Augustus had enough on his plate. He didn't want to be bothered with that region of his empire. Hence, Jesus is actually connecting a spiritual teaching to a well-known political and historical event. While we're at it, I want to also add that a mina was the equivalent of three months' wages. So if you have learned nothing else in this sermon series... You've learned that a talent was the equivalent of 20 years' wages, a denarii was one day's wages, and a mina is three months' wages. So if you ever make it to Jeopardy, and this is one of the categories, you've got the answers. But continuing on. So when he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Then another came. Lord, here's your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him, give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, But Lord, he has ten minas. Well, I tell you, that to everyone who has, more will be given. But for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Now, you know, we often head straight for the third man in the story, focusing on his inaction rather than the actions of the others. We focus on the loss of the one rather than the gains of the others. But I want to look at those guys for a second. This first servant who gave his accounting had increased his resources tenfold while the next gained five times the original investment. 
And the king acknowledges their stewardship over the investment that he had placed with them. And he reckons to them his reward. Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, I will, you shall have authority over ten cities. And you are to be over five cities. Both servants had taken what had been given to them, made use of the investment, and had accomplished something profitable for their king. They had served him well. In these first servants, we see the king's desired in outcome, an investment in his people to... This king had made these servants partners in his rule because of their initiative. So once again, I want to stop the story right here to share this insight. God's kingdom has an ability, accountability built into it. A time of reckoning will come for all believers. Christians can know they are saved through the cross of Christ and His sacrifice for their sins. And Christians can know that they will be God, with God in His heavenly kingdom because of Christ's resurrection from the dead and His ascension to the Father's right hand in heaven. These are God's gifts to believers. No one and nothing can take away from us. Now, we can walk away from these gifts but nothing can take them away from us. And so though there was a difference in what these servants accomplished, what the king was looking for was faithfulness. Luther makes this observation. He writes, Jesus wants nothing to be offered but the gift which was received. Nothing is to be taught except the word of God. Nothing is to be done except what God works in us. We are stewards, not of our own riches, but of the manifold grace of God. Turning our attention now to the third man, we see the opposite of faithfulness. This third servant only brings back the original mon of money he was given. He had wrapped it in a handkerchief and kept it safe from loss. Now, we don't know what those other servants had done with their investments. Jesus only contrasts their faithful use of the gifts given to this unfaithfulness and the inaction of this particular servant. He receives focused attention because of what he had failed to do. He had failed to accomplish the king's expected outcome. So there's only going to be two groups. Those who use the king's money well, understanding that the amount of profit is inconsequential, and those who do nothing. The third servant is a prime example of doing nothing. He had taken what he had been given. He hadn't stolen it. He didn't lose it because he did nothing with it. If he had just taken it to the bank, it would have been safe. It may have earned a little interest for the king. He claims that he's afraid of his master, that his fear led to him his inactivity. But he was thinking of himself, not his master's interest. He elected to play it safe. Afraid of making a risky investment, he made no investment at all. He was afraid that his master was expecting too much out of him. So he simply did nothing. Now the problem with this servant was his giving lip service to performing his king's will, but not exerting the necessary effort. This servant's cover-up for his laziness and, in a way, disobedience was, I played it safe. Now, in this parable, Jesus expounds a sense of risk-taking when a person serves God. Christ will not reprimand his followers for risk-taking and failure, only for unfaithfulness. He himself gave up everything to be your Savior and Lord. So in serving Christ, playing it safe is actually squandering your God-given opportunity. Peter Stanky, in his book, To Make a Difference, remarks, The kingdom of God is the heart and soul of Jesus' mission. To announce the good news of God's steadfast love and to invite others to respond to a new way of living. When reading the gospel... It is amazing how often Jesus was saying to his disciples, do something. 
Let your faith be active in love. This king judges the servant with that fear, that, he, that anger he feared. So if the fear of losing money is why you didn't use it, placing it on deposit was the safe move. The interest would at least give me something. That's the king's conclusion. The king was angry because the servant didn't have a kingdom interest. He was only looking out for himself. The king was angry because he had invested in an opportunity for his servant that his servant refused to take advantage of. The king was angry because the servant did nothing. Like the king in Jesus' story, God has given each of you gifts to be used for the benefit of the kingdom. God chooses to invest in his called out and sent out people through whom he then chooses to extend his rule and reign. Now, some believers are like this servant. They nominally identify with Jesus, but when given responsibility or expectation, they refuse to act, and they bristle when called upon to be held accountable. Believers are responsible to use what they have been given to glorify God. Remembering that the kingdom of God is a plan for the world as it should be. And remembering what the catechism teaches when we pray, Thy kingdom come, that is, we pray in this petition that it may come to us also, then we are to be mindful that citizenry in God's kingdom starts here and now on earth. And so while Paul reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, We also remember St. Peter, who appeals to us to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Jesus' parable teaches us the importance of investing for the kingdom. Unused resources and missed opportunities disappear. Underdeveloped relationships and ideas fall by the wayside. For Jesus' faithful servants, faith is not being passive while others are being active, waiting while others are being busy, stalling while others are busy problem-solving. Indeed, faith makes a maximum use of talents and resources. It operates freely without worry or self-centeredness. It energetically pursues God's mission in the world, and enthusiastically shows love for people on the fringes. God's people dare not sit idly by, not using their God-given gifts. The excuses are many. Some may feel that they're not ready. Or others may feel that they can use what they have been given, but only on a larger scale to make a bigger difference then they're be given a chance to do so. Others may think pridefully that they ought to be able to share in some of the glory instead of having to give it all to God. Still others are afraid that if they cannot produce ten times as much, they don't even want to try. Or others may see other people who have the same gift who seem to use it better with better results, so just let them do it. Some do not feel needed. Others do not seek out opportunities expecting things and people just to come to them. But to sit idly by means you will eventually lose that gift, that mina that God has given to you. As Lutherans, we treasure the words of St. Paul. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. But Paul didn't put the pen down there. He goes on and he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 25, picking up verse 31. In this section, Jesus describes the final judgment in terms of what we do, not just what we say. God holds us accountable according to his kingdom standard. Jesus says, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. 
I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger or welcome you or naked and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least these my brothers, you did it to me. From the Apology to the Augsburg Confession, one of our confessional statements of faith, the Lutheran reformers wrote these words. In these and all similar passages in which works are praised in the scriptures, it is necessary to understand not only the outward works, but also the faith of the heart. When eternal life is granted to works, it is granted to those who have been justified. Only justified people who are led by the Spirit of Christ can do good works. Without faith and Christ as mediator, good works do not please, according to Hebrews 11.6. Without faith. It is impossible to please God. May God find us faithful according to his kingdom's accountability and reckoning. And may we hear the voice of our king on that glorious day say, Well done, good servant. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.